Good evening, and you're all very welcome to tonight's webinar, which has been brought to you tonight by the Chagas Advisory Staff here in County Mayo. My name is Brendan Gary, and I work in Chagas and Bannerobe, and tonight, for the next hour, I'm delighted to be your host for this evening's webinar. Now, this evening's webinar is the fifth episode in a new seven-part series of webinars, which have ran throughout the month of January, with two more episodes yet to run in this current series, happening next Tuesday evening, 13th of February, and indeed February the 20th at 8pm, and the same link will work for each episode. Now, during this new series, we have covered some key agricultural issues facing Irish farmers in 2024, and tonight will be no different. Tonight, however, the focus switches to examining some elements of beef production systems. And I'm delighted to be joined tonight by Alan Nolan from Chagas and Ballon Robe. And Alan will give us an update on the SCEP programme that many farmers joined last year. While later, Tommy Cox, a Dairy Beef 500 programme advisor based in Chagas and Mohol. And Tommy will talk to us about the best practice regarding calf management this spring on Irish farms. Now, you, the viewers, are being encouraged to engage with our speakers here tonight, and we ask you to type your questions into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens, phones or tablets. And later this evening, Vivian Silk, the Chagas Regional Manager here in County Mayo, will put your questions live to both Alan and Tommy. So please type your questions during the night uh, into the Q&A box. As always, this webinar has been recorded and will be available to watch back on the Chagas Mayo YouTube channel in the coming days. And indeed, check out our channel there for all other previous episodes of this current series of webinars. So without further delay, I'll now ask you, Alan, to start sharing your presentation with us. And it's over to you now, Alan. Yeah, can that's you see perfect. it now, Brendan? That's perfect, Alan. Now, thank you very much. Yeah, over to you now, Alan. Okay, Brendan, and hello to everybody uh, tuning in here tonight. Uh, well, as Brendan said, my name is Alan Nolan, and I'm working here in Chagas in Ballinrobe. And tonight, I'm just going to recap and give you an overview of the SCEP scheme. Um, and maybe look at there's been a lot of, I suppose, negative press in the last few weeks and months. Uh, a lot of that has been around the review of the replacement index and the Eurostars uh, and the new Eurostar ratings that come out in the November evaluation. But I suppose my role tonight is just to recap it, but explain all the actions in full and, and explain to you as farmers how you can maximise uh, the payment in the SCEP scheme. So that's what I'm going to try and do tonight. We're not going to dwell in huge depth uh, on those new evaluations because they've been dealt with elsewhere uh, in great detail. So look at, I'll move it on here. And uh, as I said, recap initially at the beginning, look at it's a five-year uh, programme. Uh, the SCEP scheme from 23 to 27. So we've one year done already now. There was a budget there of 256 million. The closing date was the 15th of May last year. And it's unlikely to reopen because at that time it was uh, oversubscribed. There was over 20,700 farmers applied. Uh, in Mayo, we nearly had 2,000. There was uh, 1,928 farmers in Mayo applied for the scheme. I think it was the second highest um, in the country after Galway. Uh, and Last uh, December there, there was 46 million paid out to 15,000, uh, over 15,364 farmers in December there. I know that's not the full quota because there was a good few farmers pulled out um, for various reasons. Uh, we might touch on that a little bit later. And the objective of the scheme, just to remind everybody there, was to provide support to suckler farmers to improve environmental uh, sustainability of the national beef herd. So look at, uh, it was on the basis of an environmental scheme that this money uh, was secured and it's why the money is paid on a per hectare uh, basis. In terms of the SCEP payments, again, just to recap, it's paid at a, a rate of 225 euros per hectare on the first 15 hectares and 180 uh, on the remaining hectares after that. So the way that works out is that it's working out at 150 euros per suckler cow on the first 22 and a half cows, it works out here, we'd say the first 22 cows, and after that, 120 euros per suckler cow. Now, you have to take away the cost of the genotyping, which is working out at about 18 euros a head after that. And I would advise farmers there to check their ag food to see if they receive their full payment for 23. I know there was an awful lot of new payments last autumn with the base, the Chris and the eco scheme and those acres and everything thrown in there. And I think a lot of farmers weren't sure uh, did they receive their full payments. And SCEP was one of those where they mightn't be sure because there was different measures there. And if they miss some of them, they may not have got the full payment. So they can go in there on the ag food uh, account and check uh, under financial self services uh, whether they received their full payment or not. Just to recap on the scheme reference figure and where that came out of, uh, there's two figures here that we're looking for, looking at. There's the scheme reference figure, and that's based on the average of the three best years, which was 2016 to 2021. But at application time, which was last May, you had to set the yearly reference number. Now, in a lot of cases, that was the very same number again. Uh, but in some cases, some farmers um, might have opted 
um, to actually set a different number, maybe 20% lower. And there is scope again to reduce the yearly reference number by 20% without penalty. And that can be done each year and it can be done this year, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, and the option is available each spring, but there is no payment above the overall uh, scheme reference number. So changing this uh, 24 uh, yearly reference number, uh, a lot of farmers would have got a text there in the last maybe two weeks. I know some farmers are ringing me wondering what this text was about. And it's where you have the option of changing your yearly reference number for 2024. Now, if you, I must say this at the beginning, if you do not wish to change your 2024 um, yearly reference number, um, then there's no action uh, required. Now, if a farmer on the other side, if a farmer reduced their yearly reference number in 23, they can increase uh, this number back up again uh, to the scheme reference uh, number 424. So in other words, if a farmer went in last year with a reference number of 20, but reduced down to 16 for whatever reason, because maybe they hadn't enough cows at the, at the time, they can increase that back up to 20 again if the cow numbers have gone back up. You can also reduce your yearly, yearly reference number now by 20%. So again, given this example, if a farmer has a reference of 20, that farmer can reduce back to 16 now in 2024. And you might say, why would you do that uh, if you had lost land? Because you do need to maintain a certain level of land uh, to get this payment if you had reduced cow numbers. So in other words, if you had a reference of 20, but for whatever reason, you have only nine or 10 cows now and you're in danger there of not calving down the 50% requirement, uh, that would be another reason. Or you mightn't have enough calves born to reach the 70% the genotype in which I'll go through in a few minutes too. So there is reasons there why you would want to check that. So it, the biggest one is if your cow numbers are well down. So just watch that. Now, the closing date to amend your yearly reference is the 19th of February, 24. And you do that by going on to your ag food account again, or you can get your advisor uh, to do it. You go in on ag food and go into the, uh, the skip um, tab and you can go in there and change it. If you reduce the yearly reference, uh, your payment will go down for 2024, but all your scheme targets for 24 for the different actions uh, will also reduce. So that's the whole idea there, that the, the actions are calculated from this new year, uh, yearly reference figure. So I suppose the jumps you have to hit in 24 will be reduced and it'll be easier to hit the targets. Just an example I gave there already, the 20, the reference reduced down to 16. So now you need a minimum of eight calves born in 24 instead of 10 but you can increase or decrease this uh, yearly reference again in 2025. Okay. Just a few of these are very important, these eligibility requirements here that you must keep doing every year. And again, I just highlight, while again, a lot of the spotlight has been on the Eurostar ratings, uh, these requirements here are crucial because these are the ones that if you don't hit, um, you could get put out of the scheme. So you must submit a valid BIS application, which I presume every one of you will be doing, or you get no payments on any of the schemes, but you must be a member of uh, the Quality Assurance Scheme, uh, which all of you would have been if you're still in the scheme. But I suppose the important message there is that you must remain a member of the Quality Assurance Scheme for the duration of the programme up to December 27. This one here is very important, that you must calve down at least 50% of your rarely reference number each year. So what we're counting there when we're talking about year two, that's calves born from the 1st of July 23 to the 30th of June 24. And sometimes farmers get caught out there that might have calves born in next July, July 24, but they don't count in year two. They're moving on to year three already. So just watch that, that you have enough calf down there, that you have 50% calf down in this uh, period, the 1st of July to the 30th of June. You must also complete online uh, training course uh, by November 24. Now, this hasn't been released yet, so we're not sure how this is going to work. But from what we do know, it's likely to be six online modules uh, covering the five different actions of the scheme here and a separate module on farm safety. And they'll be all online, so farmers will have to log on and uh, do those uh, online modules by November 24. And again, as I said, failure to meet these requirements uh, could result in removal from the programme and worse still, uh, a clawback of money. So they're the three or four real, really critical uh, things that you must uh, watch out for there. Now, there's five actions uh, in the SCEP scheme. Okay, the eligible AI or the eligible bull, which is really the, the, the bull requirement, I'll call it. The female replacement strategy, which has got most of the, uh, I suppose, press and uh, most of the talk does be about it. Uh, you have the genotyping, you have the weight recording, 
And then you have the CAV and details and the surveys, the forms that you have to fill in um, online on ICBF or else send back uh, the survey sheets. Now, each one of these five is worth 20% of the scheme payment. And I think that's a critical point for you all to kind of see there. So while an awful lot of the focus has been on this one and an awful lot of the attention has been on it, it's still only worth 20% of the payment. Every one of the other um, four measures is worth 20%. Um, and I'm going to highlight that a few times uh, during, during the presentation here tonight. Now, obviously, you must complete all actions uh, for the whole five years of the scheme to maximise to get uh, the full payment um, uh, out of the scheme. So just looking at them individually there again. So this is the eligible AI uh, and the eligible uh, stock pool one. So in year one and two, what you needed to have there is 80% of the calves born in your herd uh, must have been sired by a four and five star um, bull. Now that could have been either AI or stock bull. Um, and that bull had to be either four or five star genotyped on either the replacement index or the terminal index. Now these uh, targets are going to increase in year three and year four, that increases to 85%. And in year five, that increases to 90%. So obviously the, the targets there are increasing. So as I said there, the calves can be sired by AI or stock bull. Okay, so it doesn't really matter wh what the bull is, whether it's AI or stock bull, it's that these figures are reached. So for year one and two, it's 80% of the calves born in your farm. So in other words, if there's uh, 10 calves born in your farm, eight of them have to be from a four and five star genotype bull. So they must be sired by genotype four or five star on either the terminal or the replacement index. For year two, which we're in now, that means that the calves that uh, will be counted for this scheme will have been born from the 1st of July 23 to the 30th of June uh, 2024. So in effect, all those calves have been sired a, a good while ago now. So for farmers that are listening there tonight, really you're planning for year three at this stage now. Um, and remember for year three, that rises to 85%. So that's the target that, that, that you're planning for now uh, when the breeding season um, starts on your farm. There was a derogation there in year one because... Um, Farmers would have had made breeding decisions before the scheme was even introduced. There was a derogation there in year one that if farmers didn't meet uh, this, the targets for this action, um, they wouldn't be penalised. But that year one derogation is now gone. So farmers need to be careful now that they do reach um, the targets uh, on this action. Just a few little pointers uh, that for my own sake there that uh, you'd kind of look out for is just be careful if you're buying in in-calf heifers that you know what they're in calf to. Um, like if you buy them in and they're in calf to a three-star um, bull, that could leave you in a bit of a problem then because those calves are born in your farm. And just for smaller herds, um, smaller herds, obviously, if you have a herd with just 10 cows, uh, there's less room there for non-eligible sires, I call it. You have to have eight there. Whereas with um, herds, bigger herds of 30, 40 cows, there's a small bit more uh, wriggle room. And just again, the new replacement index changes that came in there last November, it may have affected some stock bulls, may have affected some AI bulls that uh, you might have been used to uh, using. And just be careful there uh, using them in the future uh, and what effect that will have on the calves born on your farm. So just moving on to the replacement strategy then, and this is the one, I suppose, again, that has got all the attention. It's uh, the one on the, the female and the cows. So the 31st of October just gone by there in 2023, uh, you were supposed to have 50% of your yearly reference number must have been a uh, genotype four or five star females on the replacement index. So in other words, again, if you had a reference of 20, you needed to have 10 uh, four and five star females genotyped on this replacement index. Now that's going to rise as the years go on. There's no real target in place this year, but the next uh, target that you have to reach is the 31st of October, 2025, when it increases to 65. And at the 31st of October, um, sorry, that should be 2027 here, I just see, that increases to 75%. Um, it is based there on the yearly reference number. I stress that. So that's why if, you, if you're struggling to reach these targets, you can adjust that yearly reference um, up or down to suit within a given year. As I said again, all females must be genotyped to be eligible. It's based on the yearly reference number and females must be at least 16 months uh, at these dates on the 31st of October, 2025. Uh, to qualify. Now, just briefly to touch there on the replacement index uh, and some of the changes that came in, and there was various different 
extensions and different things happen there in the back end. It was due also to the delay in the genotype in there in August, September and October. So there was various extensions to that 31st of October deadline. I think it was the 24th of November. Initially, it was extended and then it was extended out again to the 22nd of January. So, as I said, the replacement index changes that came in there on the November 23 evaluation run. It is the first update since 2015, and it was done to reflect uh, the increased production costs that have occurred over that period and also the increased output value of stock that's been sold. There is also a number of carbon traits are also included in the new index. Um, and females, I suppose, just to explain there that females that fell from four and five stars. So in other words, there were four and five star on the September evaluation, and then they subsequently fell in the November evaluation run. Well, they will remain eligible as long as they stay in your herd. So that was there um, even last uh, November when they did bring in these changes, that was clear. Now, last week, the pre uh, minister came out with another press release and there was new flexibility brought in in this um, after pressure was brought on. So what it's really saying there is that heifers now are females born from three, four and five star cows that were three and four and five star on the September evaluation and that are sired by a four and five star bull on the replacement index will now be skip eligible. So in other words, that's females born from a three, four and five star cow. It's a, it's, it's a good bit to take in, but there is a lot more flexibility. I suppose that's the big message I want to get out there. There's a lot more flexibility than there was there uh, uh, previously. So a lot of your stock will remain uh, skip eligible. This flexibility, it exists for all years of the SCEP and females will retain this SCEP eligible status even when traded to another SCEP herd. Now, if they're traded to a non, if or a farmer not in the SCEP herd, then they lose this uh, status. So what's going to happen here is there probably will be a, a level of confusion as to what heifers or what females are eligible. So I do think this ICBF eligibility report is going to be vital now uh, going forward to provide clarity to you on what is eligible. Um, and I'll show you later where um, you can you can find that uh, report. And, and what's important there is, especially if you're selling stock or buying stock, is don't rely on old reports. It's mistakes I've seen farmers um, doing before is re relying on reports um, that might have been six months or 12 months out of date. So i just get this to move on now. Sorry there now. So this is just a picture here of the ICBF homepage. When you go in on it on the homepage, you can see here there's three green tabs here in front of you. One of them is for recording SCEP data. That's the surveys and all that information that you have to fill out. This one down here is where you record your cow and your calf weights. But this one here that you see in the middle where I have the red dot beside it is your SCEP eligibility report or profile. So you can click on that and it will give you an up-to-date on that day for all the females that are in your herd uh, on where they stand. So when you click on that, that's the page it opens here. So you can see on this farmer here, he's a skip uh, reference number of 18. You can see that over here too. Now this farmer was very lucky in that he just had a minimum uh, of nine calves born, which just about um, hit that 50% target we're speaking about. But you can also see here that the number of four and five star females that was required in that farm was nine and in the herd was 13. So you can see that he was uh, he was hitting all the targets there. So it's a very important uh, report and one that you should be aware of and you can click onto it any day uh, and see how you're faring out. You can see that in this farm already, there's a good few more because he's autumn calving, uh, 14 calves born um, this year, and they're all sired there by a four and five star bull. So it keeps you right up to date on how you're doing. Um, so you should look at that eligibility report on a fairly regular basis. So just moving on again to the genotype and now, so nothing has changed really on this one. It's just that you have to genotype 70% of your yearly reference number each year. So again, the example of our, our suckler herd with 20 or a reference of 20, you must genotype 14 animals each year to meet this uh, target. Now ICBF will nominate the animals uh, for sampling. Now there will be a little bit of a delay this year because ICBF cannot start the tag ordering process uh, till the reference numbers are confirmed by the department. And because of um, the facility to change your reference number and that being open till the 19th of February, uh, ICBF will have to wait till after that date uh, before they can start selecting animals. So what that means is that no animals will be selected till the end of February, early March at the earliest. So it means that uh, the first tags arriving on farms will probably be around mid-March. 
Uh, now, there must be calves in the ground or there must be animals available for genotyping on the farm before ICBF can send out any tags. The facility there was always there for farmers to nominate animals other than those selected. You go into self-selection in ICBF and that facility should be available there again, but won't be open yet for, for another few weeks. Now, if reducing cow numbers, the big question there is, will you have enough calves born each year to meet the 70% genotyping requirement? And that's something you need to watch out. And again, it may be a reason why you might amend your yearly reference number. Uh, the genomic samples must be returned by the 30th of November each year. Now, farmers in the National Genotyping Programme that came out there in um, last autumn, a National Genotyping Programme, and some farmers joined it. And on those farms, all calves will be DNA sampled at birth. And these samples will cover for the SCEP programme, provided you meet the 70% requirement. So these farmers in the National Genotyping Programme will not get uh, separate uh, button tags for SCEP. Just looking at the weigh in there, again, nothing has changed too much on that. You must weigh at least 80% of the eligible calves born uh, on your farm. And again, I just emphasize this point, that's the calves born from the 1st of July 23 to the 30th of June 24 for year two. And farmers do, again, get mixed up on that uh, and, and maybe don't read into what's the actual calendar year you're working for for the SCEP program. Calves must be born in the herd. Uh, you must weigh the unweaned calf and its dam on the same day. Um, and the calf is supposed to be unweaned. And sometimes that does have um, overlaps with maybe other beef schemes that, that may come in um, later on, such as the beef scheme in the past or the national welfare scheme that was there last year. The calf must be a minimum of 50 days old to be eligible. And you must submit weights to ICBF by the 1st of November each year. OK, so there was a for the SCEP scheme, there is a, a close date there of the 1st of November each year that you must get those weights in. And I emphasize again, don't forget the autumn born calves. I know of one or two farmers this year because the scheme came in uh, last spring. They missed out on weighing autumn born calves, sold the calves in maybe March, April, May last year. They weren't weighed and then they missed this 80 percent target and they lost the 20 percent then. Uh, of the payment that was due on the weigh-in section of the SCEP. So just be careful of that again uh, moving forward. You can use, as before, you can use your own scales or you can rent out the scales. Uh, the important thing there is just make sure that the scales must be uh, registered with ICBF. And the last measure then, but uh, very much uh, just as important as all the rest of them, is the calving details and these survey forms that you have to fill out. And I do think an awful lot of farmers have missed out on that because they didn't keep them up to date this year. I think ICBF used to send out the forms a lot more uh, earlier last year and a lot regular, but they're trying to encourage more and more farmers to fill them in online. So they, they, maybe farmers missed out on them last year and didn't fill them in. So there's two sections to it. There's a calf and detail section. Look, at you have to do a certain amount anyways. There's a statutory requirement there in the tagging and registration. Then you must complete the calf and survey for each calf born in the farm. And that calf and survey there consists of putting down the calf sire, the calf and ease, the calf vigor after birth, and the calf birth size. And in terms of the cow, you're you're completing the calf or the dam docility, dam milkability, dam departure reasons. After that, then there's surveys that must be filled in after five months when the calves are five months of age. And, and just to reiterate there, you must maintain the calves born in the herd for at least five months. And then complete the survey forms. And they consist again for the calves. There's calf quality and calf docility. There's a bigger, bigger list here for the cows as ca dam docility, the milkability of the dam, dam mothering, feet and legs, dam udder, dam teeth, and dam departure reason. Uh, it's important there when you're filling in these forms that you're not comparing animals to animals in the mart or to the neighbor. You're supposed to compare animals to animals in your herd. So, for example, they're the largest uh, calf born in the herd versus the smallest calf in the herd. So that's how you're rating them when you are filling in these. But as I said, again, it's very important in this one. I, I did notice a lot of farmers uh, missed out on completing that year one uh, data. And a lot of it is still outstanding. And, and many farmers were not paid the 20% of this payment there in December. Now, the good news for any of you that were in that boat is that that data can still be submitted for year one up to the 15th of February, which is coming up pretty soon. But you can still go in there online on ICBF and complete this data. This it's it's here again that you fill it on the earlier screen. I showed you the screen where you go in and hit uh, the button to get onto this uh, this uh, screen here, 
And the important one here I just want to highlight is over this side, all these lines are supposed to be over here to the right hand side at the 100%. And if that's the case, you have it all filled out. But this farmer didn't have it filled out. So this farmer didn't get this 20% payment uh, in the December there. And also missed out in the weigh-in process there because he was autumn calf and missed out on putting in the calves that were born in the autumn and weighing them. So there is things there that farmers can miss out on and it's not all about uh, their replacement uh, strategy. Just so a minute or two now, Alan. Yeah, I'm moving on there quick, Brendan. I suppose the big point about this, not looking at the the penalties in the in the female strategy, I suppose the big point I want to make is that there is more flexibility than the BDGP scheme. Now, if you do fail three or more of the actions, there is you will be removed from the program. So it's important to stay up to date with most of them. But there is more flexibility than the BDGP. And you can still get a significant payment even if you do not meet the female replacement targets. So if the female replacement strategy target is difficult to achieve or even uneconomical, in other words, if you go out and buy a lot of heifers at a high price, uh, to achieve and, and you subsequently fail this action, you will get a penalty, but you will remain in the scheme. Okay, so that's that's the big thing there and you will not be thrown out of the scheme and you can still draw down a significant amount of money uh, even even if you do get a penalty on that one. So the final few comments, Brendan, there, as I said, it's a five-year commitment. We've one year done. So just retain the quality assurance certification, complete all the actions to get the full payment and complete those survey forms. There's not a lot of work involved in them, but there's 20% of the payment. Look out for them online training modules when they come out. Look at monitor the, the Eurostar ratings on an ongoing basis. Check that eligibility profile. And look at just to finally recap, and there has been a little bit of negative talk at times there and farmers talking about withdrawing and everything. If you withdraw, all monies will be repaid unless it's a force majeure or a transfer of holding case where a father is transferring to a son. So I would say think uh, before you act. Look at the financial value of the skep. Again, of our example of the 20 cow herd, a reference figure there getting a payment of 20 cows by 150 is 3,000. Take out the genotype and you have an annual payment there of 2,700. Given over five years is 13,700. So it's a, a significant payment. Brendan, I won't dwell there other than to highlight for farmers, there is likely to be a national beef welfare scheme again in 24. We don't know much about it. But all those schemes in the past have been for, for one year. So they might suit a lot of farmers, even not in the skep. Um, and the other thing about it is watch out. Uh, you won't automatic, automatically be applied. You will have to apply on ag food um, to get in on them. So look at Brendan, I'll hand back to you and I'm open to questions later on. Thanks very much, Alan, there now. I'll get you just to stop sharing your presentation. And in this stage, uh, I'll just call on our next speaker there, uh, Tommy Cox there. And Tommy is going to uh, I suppose start sharing your presentation. So I'll uh, just turn off your camera there, Alan. And indeed, uh, over to you now, Tommy. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's perfect, Tommy. That's Thank perfect. you for that. You. No. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Uh, as Brendan says, Tommy Cox is my name. I'm a Dairy Beef 500 advisor based in, in the west of Ireland. Um, so look, um, what we're going to look at here this evening for the next 20 minutes or so, I suppose, is all the important areas around uh, calf rearing. The dairy farmers are in the tick of calf rearing, are in the tick of calving at the moment, and the next few weeks, we'll see a lot of calves traded between both enterprises. So we'll look at some of the important areas for beef farmers taking on these calves and look at some of these um, important areas are particularly relevant to, to sucklers as well. So we'll just look, have a look at, at some of the important uh, areas for looking at. So, um, so just the, the first thing that we're looking at, I suppose, is, is sourcing the right calf. You know, that's the solid foundation of your, of your dairy calf to beef enterprise, getting that right calf on the ground. So what do you want from your calf? You know, you want a healthy calf. You want a healthy calf that's going to go on, it's going to be healthy when you get them. That's going to continuously perform. And more importantly, that isn't going to bring any hard health issues onto your farm. You want a calf from a trusted source, okay? From a trusted source, what we're talking about is someone that's doing a good job on their calf rearing, you know, that's treating their calf similarly to their to their way that they're treating their replacement heifers. You know, they're giving them adequate levels of colostrum. They're putting them in a good environment. And, you know, their general management practices around that calf are to a high standard. Value for money is is hugely, hugely important. You know, if you pay over the odds day one when you purchase a calf, the profit was, uh, will be eroded eventually when you when you sell that animal. So, you know, paying over the odds day one, you're continuously trying to chase that profit. So if you give too much the first day, you will make less of a profit when you when you do finish the animal or, or sell the animal. Age of three weeks or greater, we're working with 16 farmers right around the country and we would be advocating that the calf is at least three weeks of age or greater. Why? Because 
I suppose at that stage, the calf is over, you know, some of the diseases, the younger calf diseases, certain, your certain scours. Generally at that stage as well, you know, a certain amount of the cost of the rareness is, is, is uh, diluted as well. So that's important to get that older calf. An animal that won't disappoint at slaughter. And that's hugely, hugely important. A farmer gets paid for carcass weight. So the higher kilos of carcass you can achieve at slaughter will mean the higher value of a check you will have home for, for that animal. And this is probably a big area that we're really looking into in the last couple of years, you know, the genetics of the calf, especially with beef bred animals, you know, your early mature and your continental type animals, you know, getting farmers to record that data and use, you know, genetics with good beef uh, characteristics, such as carcass weight, carcass confirmation and feed uh, intake. You know, that's hugely, hugely important. So look, I suppose these two pictures sum it up fairly well. What you're looking for is, you know, a good healthy calf from a good environment at three weeks of age. And then that animal will perform well right throughout his life cycle. And when the time comes, he will produce a, a good beef carcass for, for the farmer. Okay, so just looking at some of the physical characteristics of the animal that you're looking at when you are purchasing your calf. You know, you go into a pen of calves, what are the things you, you should be looking for? You should be looking for a calf with a clean, damp nose and bright eyes. You know, any calves with mucus out of his nose, you know, any sign of uh, runny eyes, any calf that's, um, you know, a small bit lethargic in himself or away from the rest of the calves or maybe with a drooped ear, they're calves that you would be avoiding because there might be, if there might be some sort of illness there at present or there might be an onset of some illness coming. No lameness in any calves, you know, you want a calf that's there's no signs of any uh that had any previous issues with joint hill or there's any deformity in the calf you know that's that's something that you would be avoiding you're looking for a calf with a navel cord that's dry that's withered and shriveled you know that'll indicate that the calf is at least t uh, 10 days to two weeks of age but it'll also tell you that you know the, the calf's navel was treated with a disinfectant and that's that will show probably good practices from your from the dairy farm or the farm of origin. Um, and that's that's something that you would be desired to see. Relaxed breeding, which is which is also important to, to uh pneumonia is a is a common issue with young calves. You know, it's a hugely, hugely common. It's one of the main diseases that affect young calves. So you'd like to see a calf with relaxed breeding that he had no previous issues with pneumonia or there's no issues with pneumonia oncoming. And any other visible uh, signs of disease would obviously scour being your 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 next big one with your young calves. You would be avoiding calves from that, uh, generally from that farm because you don't want to be bringing in something to your own farm. You know, you might have 20 or 30 calves there present on your own farm, young calves, similar age, you know, and that's something that, and it can bring on a, a, a lot of issues for your farmer. So just looking at the calf here, the first image, you know, you can see the calf there. He's... He's healthy, alert. He's a bit of straw out of his mouth. You know, he's 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 up and he, he's active. Similar to, to our second image there, you can see our our calf. Um, he's he's um, up and about. And this calf down the back is probably a calf that you will be looking at. See, does he get up and stretch himself when you when you do uh, go into the pen? That's an, a sight that you like to see. You know, a calf with a shriveled navel, and um, that's a sign that the calf's navel is treated, and he, he's definitely a fortnight or so old. And obviously, look, at that's an obvious sign of, of scouring a calf. You know, there's so many different scours, uh, so many different bacteria causing scour out there. And, you know, bringing a calf onto your farm that was exposed to calves with scour or that has scour, you're running the risk of bringing some of them uh, bacteria onto your, onto your own holding. Okay, so look at the calf source greatly influences the risk of disease. You know, how well he's reared, you know, if, when he hit, if a calf hits the ground, um, he's fully naive and how well he's reared within the first couple of hours of birth and then over the, the following couple of weeks will depend on the level of immunity to the, the, the level of immunity that calf will build up to the disease. Okay, so look, if you can minimize the number of sources from where you're purchasing your calves, you're, you're obviously minimizing the, the risk of bringing on the disease. If you're buying a calves from a lot of sources, you know, there's a lot of contact with other animals, you're increased chances of, of bringing disease onto, onto the farm. Gather as much information on the herd health status of the, the origin herd. So if you're dealing directly with a dairy farmer, you know, if you can have the conversation with him, is he vaccinating for anything on the farm, you know, or what's what's actually going on going on there? Is there any previous um, 
current disease issues on the farm, obviously scour pneumonia is ranting, is ranting, uh, causing problems there on the farm. Has the calves sires uh, registered against them, and that's something that we'll we'll, we'll talk about in a, in a moment or two. But you, you would be recommending that you know that farmers are buying calves with with sires recorded against them. It's beneficial to Venice to farm, you know, to see what's going on, see what sort of environment the calves are in, and see what sort of level of management is is the calves are being treated. You know, ideally, this is the sort of environment you'd like to see calves adequate straw, adequate space, and you know, adequate ventilation. Um, that's that's the ideal. Um, that's the ideal scenario that you're looking for. Ideally, if you can source calves locally, you know, you'll 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 reduce the the stress of the transport. Um, you know, so the calves traveling a long distance increase the stress and increase the, the likelihood of bringing out of disease onset. And then the number of sources, you increase the number of sources, you increase the, the disease pressure on on the farm. Okay, so. Look, a new tool that was launched by the the Irish Cattle Breeder Federation in 2021, the, the CBV or the commercial beef value. You know, we looked in the last couple of slides about the importance of getting a healthy calf. This is probably more so the importance of getting the calf with, you know, the genetic potential to perform from birth right through into slaughter. OK, so the CBV, it's a tool to identify these calves. How does it identify these calves? It gives them a euro value based on the genetic potential of their parents. Alan would have spoke to you about replacement indexes and uh, a terminal indexes in his previous presentation. This is would be similar, but it's solely based on uh, the beef capacity of that animal. You know, so how that animal is going to perform when when slaughtered. It's a euro. Of, it's the animal is given a euro value based on the genetic potential of the parents. So it takes into account the beef characteristics, the sole beef characteristics of the di of the sire and dam of that animal. Okay, so it compromises of six traits from the beef sub-index and it also contains a carbon trait. So them six traits are carcass weight, which is hugely, hugely important at slaughter. Carcass conformation, also important. Feed intake, how much that animal uh, will eat versus the weight he puts on. Docility, age of slaughter, and then the factory in spec. You know? So they're all important traits uh, for people that slaughter slaughtering cattle. It's generated for all animals that are likely to be finished, you know, so on animals that are that are destined for slaughter. OK, so there's different categories of those animals that what we're talking about here today are dairy type stock. You know, so you have your Frisian animals from your dairy herd. You'll also have your beef cross animals from your dairy herd. And as Alan was speaking about earlier on, your your, your suckler type animals. So animals are assigned to one of three different breed types. They're also assigned a star rating of one of the five within them breed types. OK. Um, so where can you get these CBVs? Anyone that has a Herd Plus account has access to their CBV profile on that. So you go into your uh, Herd Plus account, you go into the profile section, and it'll give you a CBV profile option. And um, that option is there to view for all farmers with, with that Herd Plus account. Going forward, if you're purchasing calves on the Mart, and a lot of calves do be traded through the Marts at, at this time of year, it will also be included on mart boards, but only where animals are genotyped. Why is it only where animals are genotyped? Because the ICBF and the marts want to be uh, fully sure that the correct sire and dam are recorded against the animal to ensure the accuracy of the, 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 the CBV. Okay, so just how do the star ratings work? So if you're going to a farmer and you're buying a group of, say, for example, Angus type calves, you're looking here, if you want to buy a four or a five star animal, you'd be looking for an animal with a value of greater than 79 euros. So animals, anything from a, a value of 80 euros or up will be will be a four star animal. You know, the recent research from, from Chagas Grange is showing significant favor. The higher the star of the animal, the higher the performance at, at slaughter. You know, you're probably talking... 20 to 30 kilos of carcass between of a difference between five star and and one star and with the initial reports coming from both ICBF and our research center in Grange. For dairy cross our dairy cross dairy animals, you know, so your Frisian cross animals, you know, to be in the, the higher end of the, the beef characteristics and in, in that animals, you're looking for an animal with a, a CBV value of greater than 30 euros. Okay. So that's that's generally the, the value that you would you will be looking for. Well, when you when you are sourcing them animals, if you're going to the marts, that's just an example of a mart board with a with a CBV on it. So look at um 
they will be generated for for animals, as I said, with the genotype, uh, with the genotype accounted for. You know, going forward, you know, this prof or this um this new tool will become more bulletproof. There's over five hundred thousand dairy cows um enrolled in the, the national genotyping program. So the the data that's coming in from them animals will become more uh, bulletproof when, when when the genotypes are verified. Okay. So look, that's the important areas of looking, getting the looking for a healthy calf and uh, and getting the calf in with the right genetics. So now we'll probably for the next couple of moments we look about trying to keep that calf healthy. Okay, so the calf housing or the environment that the calf is 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 kept in is crucially crucially important of keeping a high level of 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 calf health. You know what are the key areas that are important areas that you're looking for in a calf house? Ventilation. Okay, so. Why is ventilation important? Ventilation is probably, fresh air is probably one of the best uh, natural disinfectants out there, okay? So air moving above the animals that's bringing any stale air, any bugs and bacteria out of the shed is, is, is hugely, hugely important. Um, you don't want any drafts, and there's a big difference between ventilation and drafts. Ventilation is air moving above the animals, removing um, removing any stale air, as I said, or, or bugs or bacteria, whereas drafts, you know, is is air hitting the animal at, at ground level, and that's something that you don't want in the young calves, or it can cause a chill and it can cause stress to the animal, and then it'll bring on the onset of pneumonia. Hygiene and cleaning, so keeping the environment clean, you know, it result the uh, risk of of pathogens building up, and it'll help keep the keep the calf healthy. Clean and dry bedding, and look at probably it's a conversation that that's been had right around the the country at the moment. Where do we get the next bale of straw or how much do we have to give for it? But I suppose one place I'd say you can't afford to skimp is is on straw with the with the with the young calves. You know, providing that straw, it's a secondary to, to fresh air. It's it's an actual an excellent um it's an excellent disinfectant, you know, keeping that calf dry, keeping them up, up off off the ground where the, the pathogens are and 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 keeping them in, in that environment. Adequate space, you know, enough space for the calf for for lying down getting up and moving around you know you're talking between two to two and a half meters squared per per calf is the ideal space allowance for 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 them animals okay so just look at touching briefly on the, the ventilation again you want drafts is, is, is hugely hugely important the shed orientation look at whatever sheds you have at the moment the timers the sheds you're going to have in in three weeks time when calves start hitting farms you know, if you're thinking about putting up a shed, ideally you want it at right angles to prevail in wind. That'll bring the wind in in over the animal. Air outlet based on the max uh, stocking rate. You know, every calf requires 0.3 to 0.4 meter, 0.03 to 0.04 meters cubed of an outlet. So for the max number of calves, you, you are going to hold it in that shed. You know, that's the air the air, um, the air outlet you, you need to provide. Inlets are generally double that you know so you're talking 0.08 uh, meters cubed and that's that's generally what 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 you're talking about there and the roof should be pitched at 15 to 22 degrees but look i suppose that's all uh that's all uh in an ideal world you know what i would be saying is there for 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 dozy you know that sheds mightn't be you know what what what's there there is options you know to put in little micro environments you know like we have here you know little uh, canopies to provide extra heat to calves um, there is also options maybe to remove certain air or sheets to increase airflow, and then, as I said earlier on, the, the straw. Um, then finally, look at the warm, dry, and easy to pe- clean pens is important. You know, temperature is important for young calves. Ideally, you'd like a shed, you know, to be close to to fifteen to twenty degrees Celsius at all times. That's the sort of temperature that the calf desires. Um, ensure enough straw for nesting where where possible. Um. You know, if, if if the straw is and there is an adequate straw there, there maybe is options to put down a, a layer of wood chip and then put straw on top of that. But wood chip on, on its own won't suffice. You know, you need that straw for the calves to, to nest. And then the slope for drainage. Look at I heard of some farmers maybe putting in pallets and 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 bedding on top of that to try and improve improve the drainage to reduce straw. You know, it is options. There is other options there that you know the farmers that might be able to use. You know, cattle mats or something like that to try and to try and improve improve the drainage. Okay, so look at feeding the calf. Look at it's important as well. You know, ensuring the calf gets enough uh, milk. Um, typically, a calf will want six liters. You know, until they're at least thirty-five days of age. You know, the quantity of milk replacer 
can be reduced after that. You know, you can re- afford to reduce or, or drop back your, your, your milk replacer after that. When you're mixing your milk replacer to make one liter of mixed milk at 12 and half percent solids, you mix 125 grams of milk powder and to set 875 ml of water. And that's important. A lot of people might mix a liter of water with uh, 125 grams of, of uh, powder. You know, the ideal way of doing it or the correct way of doing it is putting 125 grams of powder and 875 ml of water. What we're targeting, you know, 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8 of a kilo a day during that period. Ideally, what you're looking for is a calf to double his birth weight, you know, from 35 to 40 kilos in eight weeks. You know, so you're looking for a calf around eight kilos at, at eight weeks of age. A young animal is most efficient. You know, that young calf, is, is he'll turn feed into weight very, very efficiently. You know, so when you view feeding well at a young age, they will, will perform. Weight gain depends on the quality and quantity of feed. You know, so as we're talking about, that's just a typical um, milk feeding uh, scenario. So 500 grams of milk replacer at the start, increasing it then to, 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 to 750 grams until the calf is six to seven weeks of age. And if management and that is is uh, is uh, good, you can afford to drop that back after that, thereafter. Okay, so look, just quickly on some of the main points in selecting a milk replacer. This is probably crucial, you know, that the milk is derived from skim or whey-based powder, you know. That's that's hugely, hugely important. The vegetable-based uh, milk replacer wouldn't be of, of, of as high a quality. You're looking for a protein content Greater than 20%, you know, 20 to 23% is pr- particularly fine for, for beef calves. An oil content of 18 to 20%, an ash content of less than 8%, and a fiber content of less than 0.015%. You know, a higher fiber content than that will indicate uh, a high amount of vegetable uh, oils being used in the, in the making of the milk replacer. You want it easy dissolved, you know, that it'll mix, the concentration will mix easily and it'll, it'll mix correctly. So that's just to look at a typical example of, of what you should be looking for in your milk replacer. You know, crude protein, 23%, fiber, uh, 0.1, crude ash, calcium, you know. So that's just an example. So they're the things that you should be looking for if you are buying milk replacer. So mixing it, look at, it's, it might all sound very simple and it is, you know, high levels of hygiene. Keep your equipment clean. Use the scales to measure the powder and that's important, you know. The twelve and a half percent is is you know is is uh, is is hugely hugely important that it's mixed correctly. You know different batches will have different weights, so mix mix accordingly. Ideally, you want to mix at forty degrees. You know if you're mixing it uh, any warmer than that, you'll damage the milk proteins. If you're mixing any colder than that, the calf will use energy to to try and heat that up. So you're mixing it. You know in in around thirty seven to thirty nine degrees is what the calf's what the calf's body temperature is at. Um. Reconstitute by adding the total amount of powder and then mix mix the water water thoroughly. Mix using a whisk. You know, there's automatic feeders and all that out there that's, that's very fancy, but they come at, at a huge, huge cost. You know, simple things like a cordless drill and a, and a skim mix on it will, will mix milk uh, quite quite uh, sufficiently and quite adequately. Just another weaning, minute, or, minute or so now, Tommy, if you can. Okay, yeah. sound. Thanks, Brendan. So look, at weaning, you know, concentrates is, 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 is important. Getting the concentrates into the calf developing that room and so a highly quality quality uh palatable uh ration should be offered to the calf and it should be offered ad lib you know 17 18 percent crude protein is what you're looking for um within that straw again look at i'm fond of straw but that's the ideal perform of a form of roughage you know it'll provide that scratch effect in the in the in the room and but it also will prevent the calf from from over gorging on it um when you're weaning your calves, you know, it shouldn't be made on age. It should be made on how much concentrates they're eating and on weight. You know, ideally 90 kilos and they're eating at least a kilo and a half to two kilos for three or four days prior to, to, to dropping them back on the milk. You know, minimize stress at weaning, which is important. You know, if the calves are slightly off in themselves, if there's a bit of cost or there should be no disbudding or anything like that done at weaning. You can see there the water trough on the image on the right-hand side. That's crucially, crucially important. Calves need water. You know, a calf will drink three or four, at least three or four liters of water a day, and it needs to be made available at all times. So just looking at the calf health, Brendan, before, before we wrap it up, you know, the colostrum, as we spoke about there, is, is, is important. You know, getting the antibodies into the calf from a young age. The first feed uh, w- within two hours of at least three liters, you know, and that's that's important. So look at the common illnesses. Pneumonia and scour are the big ones that, you know, that we see in young calves. Pneumonia, the obvious signs, you know, coughing, um, increased respiratory rate, a temperature, treatment, 
anti-inflammatories, antibiotics, and get in there quick because the calf gets a bad bout of pneumonia. It's going to affect them going forward. Similarly with your scour, your rotavirus, your coronavirus, your E. coli, your crypto and coxie. Coxie. There is vaccines available for against rota, corona, and and E. coli. Your your rotavirus, corona will cover that. Your crypto, there is a new vaccine coming on the market, you know, but they're all only as good as the amount of uh, beestins or colostrum the calf will, will get. Treatment with oral fluids, anti-inflammatories, you know, where cases are severe, you know, you will need to intervene with intravenous fluids and antibiotics. So look, this is just the final slide. Um, you know, a sample vaccination plan, you know, an intranasal vaccine at a, at, at a couple of days old to prevent pneumonia, at two weeks of age, an IBR vaccine to, to cover against your IBR. At six weeks, um, a clostridial vaccine followed by a booster at 10 weeks, a follow-up IBR vaccine then at, at, at 12 weeks of age. And then uh, prior to housing, you have your your intramuscular um, RSV, PI3 and uh, Mannheimia vaccination. You know, that'll cover your, your three common causes of, of pneumonia in, in your calves at housing. And then an IBR and faster ideal vaccine then at, at, at um, pre, uh, a post-turnout then for at, at the second year. Look at coccidiosis prevention may be required but look at the reality of it is no amount of vaccines will prevent a herd health breakdown if management isn't up to, you know, nutrition, colostrum, uh, hygiene isn't isn't uh, up to scratch. So, look, Brendan, thanks very much for that. Um, hand it over for any questions. Thank you very much, Tommy. I'll just get you just to stop sharing your presentation there now. Yep. And indeed, at uh, this stage of the evening, I now go to our regional manager, Vivian Silk. I'll ask you, Alan, maybe as well, just to come and turn on your camera, maybe as well there, Alan. And uh, so I'll hand it over to you now. And good evening, Vivian. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, thanks to Tommy and Ellen for their informative presentations. A couple of questions coming in there, folks, and we'll still have time to take a few more before the, the evening closes. Uh, Tommy, I'll give you a chance to catch your breath. Ellen, a question has come in there in terms of the reference number you spoke about it at length. So um, how can I increase the yearly reference number? Or First of all, can that be done? No. I can't, uh, well, what can't be done is you can't increase the scheme reference number, Vivian. So if you had a scheme reference based from the what you had calved down in 2016 to 21. Unfortunately, you cannot increase that if, say, you were a new farmer starting off and you started off with low numbers. Um, now, if you had a scheme reference number last year, we have the example of 20, and for whatever reason you reduced it last year down to 16, you can increase that back up to 20. So it's your yearly reference that goes up and down, but the overall scheme uh, reference, you can't go above that figure that you had. So there may be, like everything, winners and losers, but if there was somebody that started off low and they built up, hopefully in the next skep Vivian or the next okay. BDGP that they'll win out in that one. Yeah. Yeah. That's the kind of sentiment of the question. So this person started cave and cows in 16, got into them mm. uh, slowly, gradually increased to 20 cows for 2023, but the reference uh, it only turned up nine. So it was based on 16 to, was it 16, 21, yeah. Ellen, was it? Yeah. The best of those. Yeah, so look, so hopefully that... in the next uh, suckler scheme, they'll get the full quota and the full reference if there is a follow on to skep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, if a stock bull drops, uh, Ellen, from a four or five star to a three, to a three star, how will this affect the farm that's in skip at the minute? Okay, Vivian. So look at the the stock bull itself. As long as that stock bull stays in the herd, the same as in the BDG in the in the past, um, that bull will qualify you. Uh, and and reach the 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 bull uh, target. We'll put it that way. I suppose what you want to watch there is if you're breeding replacements from that stock bull, uh, some of those females may not qualify in the future if you're if you're looking for them. So that's something to be careful of. And just the other side there is Vivian. Maybe in in some bigger herds, um, if you have two stock bulls, um, and if one st- stock bull drops there, there could be an issue there. Um, because in the past in the BDGP you only needed one bull to qualify but in this remember it's all about the 80 percent the 85 percent and the and the 90 percent target there so you have to be uh, you have to watch out on that one and finally just if you're buying a bull vivian mm-hmm. uh, it you will need a new it will be based on the new index so you so, need to make sure that that one is genotype four and five star in the new index so that the i suppose the the advice helen is if you're buying a bull in 2024 for this breeding season if you're definitely going after the replacement index he needs to be strong on that yeah, but also more importantly, definitely needs to be genotyped so that the figures will will stand with them. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks, Alan. Right, Tommy. Um, a farmer, sorry, a farmer is currently buying dairy calves through the March to spring, uh, or would you recommend buying calves directly from dairy farms uh, in maybe in the locality? 
Yeah, look, um, 23, the marts have a huge, huge, important role to play in trading the calves. Like over 22% of dairy calves are traded through marts. But look, you know, it's, there's no guarantee if you, if you buy locally that your calves will stay healthy. But if you can reduce the number of sources, if you are buying a mart, if you can buy a, a, a larger number from the one farmer within the mart, will generally help to reduce the risk of, of uh, bringing on any disease onto your farm. Okay, okay. And um, you, you mentioned there towards the end, Tommy, you might run out in a small bit of time, but is there a difference between whey and skim milk powder? No, look, once the, once, uh, the milk uh, replacer is derived from either whey or skim, there's no difference in any of the results performance-wise from, from feeding either. Once they're fed, mixed correctly, fed uh, appropriately, and, you know, to tick all the boxes with regards, you know, crude protein, oils, ash, and and uh, fiber, you know, once to tick all the boxes with regards that. Okay, okay. Um, back to Eleanor for a minute. You mentioned during your presentation that the indexes or the, the values within the indexes have changed since the original one back in 2015. The questions just come in there. Can you explain what is a carbon trait and where it is derived from within the index as it stands? Yeah, well, look at Vivian, there might be people better qualified than me to do that. I suppose the reason why it's there for a start is... As we all know, agriculture is supposed to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2030, and breeding is seen to have a, a fairly big role to play in that. Um, I'd also point out there that the carbon uh, change that are brought about in the replacement index is actually only a very small amount. I think it's only 13%, so nearly 90% was due to the change in cost, the production costs, and uh, and all that. But Vivian, a lot of the carbon would come from a lot of the traits that we know. It's not just a simple answer. There's things like cow size, uh, feed efficiency, feed intake, all those sort of things kind of come into it, the fertility targets. Uh, they will all, all play into it. Um, not to put it aside, but there was a presentation given by Paul Cross in there at the National Beef Conference, and I think that paper is still up online, which would explain it in, in great detail, because it's a, it's a difficult enough question to answer here, Vivian, just in, yeah. in a very short space of time. Okay, okay. Thanks, Alan. Um, back, to, back to you, Tommy, now. Um, where pneumonia has been an issue on farms, would you recommend vaccinating calves this spring? Yeah, look, um, going back to it, definitely the vaccines will, will help. But I'd look at the shed, first of all, is there anything you can do? Maybe is there a draft in the shed or is there, is there anything you can do to improve the airflow? Um, you know, and that together with the vaccination plan, complemented, both of them complemented together should decrease any issues with pneumonia, you know. But definitely I would look at the environment, first of all, try and improve airflow or decrease airflow and then add the vaccine to it as well. That should help uh, prevent or reduce the issue. Okay, okay. Um, the final question, Ellen, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. So if I haven't enough deer, if I haven't enough calves born on the farm to meet the 70% genotyping for, for, for 24, can I genotype other botting cattle or other cattle on the farms that haven't already been genotyped? Yeah, you can, Vivian, is the simple answer to that. So if you had some of Tommy's calves that were brought in, we'll say mm. dairy bred calves, uh, they can be genotyped. You might have other maybe store cattle on the farm that you're buying in for finishing. They can be genotyped. The only thing I'd say to watch out there is a lot of the dairy farmers now are in the National Genotyping Program. I think there's a fair share of them. So if those calves are already genotyped coming onto your farm, you won't be able to genotype them a second time, if you understand me. So you have to watch out that those calves um, aren't genotyped already. But yes, is the answer to the question, I guess. Okay, I know if you click into the Eurostar profile on the ICBF website, it'll tell you, give you a full list of your animals that are genotyped and aren't. So if you're in the suckler scheme, the BDGP scheme, and now the skip scheme, an awful lot of your animals at this stage would be genotyped in terms of the females. But it's, it's yeah, it's bought in ones are people that weren't in the BDGP that entered SCEP for the first time, um, mm. some of their females may not be genotyped at this stage. So yeah, it's, it's, it's something to watch. You need to keep an eye on it. And thanks and just with those dairy fellas that are in that national genotyping program yeah, now too. Yeah, yeah, so check the profile often is, is, the, is the advice. Thanks very much, Ellen and uh, Tommy, for, for, for the presentation this evening. I'll hand it back to Brendan to conclude. Thanks very much, Vivian. Indeed, uh, we're just about out of time this evening. I'd like to thank our two panellists here tonight, Tommy and indeed Alan, for great presentations. And indeed, we'll get those shared with our viewers there because there was a lot of detail in them and I think we were tight on time. But again, I suppose, look, thanks again to uh, you, Vivian, for facilitating the questions and answers. And indeed, 
thanks to you at home for staying with us this evening and engaging and asking questions of our panellists. We hope you found this webinar beneficial. We'll get the recording uploaded to our Chagos Mayo YouTube channel in the coming days. And indeed, so keep an eye out for that. All that's left for me to say is that we'll be here again next week uh, for episode six in the series where my colleague Austin Callaghan from Chagos and Clare Morris will give us an account there on the farm building grant scheme known as TAMS 3. Uh, while Porik Walsh from Chagos and Ballina will talk to us there about the benefits there of completing the Chagos Green Start. So that's all happening next Tuesday evening at 8 p.m. And the same link will work for next episode. So indeed, uh, from us all here in Chagos and Mayo, it's good night and we'll see you all again next week, folks. Good night now.